everybody. I am Dr. Gaurav Padhuri, and I will be talking to you today. So I welcome you all for joining me today in this case study. I am a consultant in the Department of Diabetes and Endocrinology at Medical Superspeciality Hospital. Today's case is a 57-year-old type 2 diabetes for four years, and the patient visited the clinic with weakness in the past two months. During routine checkup, she complained of generalized weakness and hospitalized for ACS one year ago. The current medication the patient is receiving is metformin one gram twice a day, glimepiride four milligram once a day, losartan 50 milligram, atoprostatin 40 milligram, amlodipin 5 milligram, chlorthalidone 12.5 milligram, metoprolol 50 milligram, all once a day, along with aspirin 75 milligram once a day. The laboratory parameters show the HbA1c at 8.2%. LDL cholesterol is 55, HDL 37, triglyceride 156, and total cholesterol 168. The AST is 33, serum creatinine is 1.1 milligram per deciliter, EGFR comes out at 65 ml per minute per 1.73 meters square. Urine ACR is 150. The physical examination shows the BMI of the patient at 31. The blood pressure is 120 by 70, and the heart rate is 78 beats per minute. Now, given this situation, we must understand that the patient is not in a good glycemic control. So along with optimization of the glycemic control, the very much important should be given to the cardiorenal protection for this particular patient. And HbA wants a goal for many non-pregnant adults of less than 7% is appropriate. On the basis of provider judgment and patient preference, achievement of lower HbA1c levels such as 6.5% may be acceptable if this can be achieved safely without significant hypoglycemia or other adverse effects of treatment. A better management during the last two decades allowed reducing the incidence of CV complication, yet the residual risk remains high in patients with type 2 diabetes. CKD remains a concern, at least partly due to the premature death among type 2 diabetic patients. Renal disorders are common in type 2 diabetic patients with approximately 50% of patients developing some degree of renal impairment and an increasing prevalence of both conditions over time. The risk of renal disorders in type 2 diabetes include the development of multiple phenotypes of organ damage of an overlapping and untimely progressing similar to what occurs for cardiovascular disease. The emperor egg outcome, we all know, was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three trial involving 720 people with type 2 diabetes, almost all with established cardiovascular disease. The mean GFR at baseline was 74.1, and the median urine ACR was 18. Pre-specified renal outcomes in this study included Incident or worsening nephropathy defined as progression to macroalbuminuria doubling of serum creatinine associated with the EGFR, a main driver for the reduction in nephropathy with empagliflozin, was a slower progression to macroalbuminuria. Compared with placebo, empagliflozin was also associated with significant improvement in a post hoc composite endpoint of incident or worsening nephropathy or CV death progression to macroalbuminuria, and initiation of renal replacement therapy with no differences reported between the two therapeutic doses of empagliflozin. The inhibition of SGLT2 leads to tumor globular feedback via enhanced natriuresis and delivery of sodium to the macular tensor, thereby decreasing diabetic glomerular hyperfiltration due to hyperglycemia. It is hypothesized to reduce the resulting chronic kidney damage. The ketone bodies are a more energy-efficient fuel in renal tubular cells than glucose. And as a result, renal oxygen consumption is reduced in the presence of mild ketosis. Hence, it has been suggested that the use of ketone bodies as energy substrate in patients receiving SGLT2 inhibitors may contribute to the renoprotective effect of these agents with a similar mechanism as seen in the myocardium. The TP4 inhibitors reportedly ameliorated renal function and pathology in diabetic kidney disease. Linagliptin decreased podocyte apoptosis 
one feature of TKD pathology by enhancing insulin signaling. Carmelina study, which is a linagliptin CV outcome study, confirmed that linagliptin reduced the progression of albuminuria by 14%. Moreover, linagliptin demonstrated CV safety, including in those patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. Linagliptin slowed progression of albuminuria without affecting EGFR slope or any other kidney outcome. There is a strong rationale for combining a DPE-4 inhibitor and CV protective class of ASGLT2 inhibitor in patients with type 2 diabetes because two drugs exert different and complementary glucose lowering effects. Furthermore, the increase in glucagon levels induced by ASGLT2 inhibitors may be blunted by the co-administration of DPE-4 inhibitor. Clinical evidence shows that SGLD2 inhibitor and DPE4 inhibitor in combination is an effective option for management of type 2 diabetes, providing HbA1c reduction of 1.1 to 1.5% and weight reduction of approximately 2 kg when added to metformin, which is its primary place in therapy. In phase 3 randomized trial investigating efficacy and safety of empagliflozin and linagliptin, Better tolerability was observed in patients who were on empalina combination than those on alone on empagliflozin. In terms of serious adverse events, 4.4 versus 7.1%, hypoglycemia 3.6 versus 3.5%, and even in genital infections, 2.2 versus 8.5%. So this fact implies that empalina add-on to metformin constitute equal or rather even better tolerability than monotherapy when additive glycemic efficacy in uncontrolled, uncontrolled patient. This unique combination lends itself readily to early treatment intensification because of good glycemic control and tolerability, possible weight loss, CD protection, and minimal treatment burden and offers the renal protection in patients with type 2 diabetes at very high severe risk. Thank you.